Democrats. Today is Thursday, April 4th, and it's time for the Chairs Daily Live. Happy Thursday. And because it's Thursday, we are um, blessed to have a legislative update brought to us by Representative Mickey Dollins. Hey, Alicia, how are you doing on this beautiful spring afternoon? I am awesome, Rep Dollins. Uh, how are you doing? I have to agree. I'm doing very well. Is the same. I'm doing very well and uh, excited to give you all a uh, weekly update here. So I want to start with I heard good news, right? One of your bills not only made it out of committee, it made it off the House floor, but now I hear that it made it off of the Senate floor. It did. Yeah. House Bill 3943 would increase transparency and accountability within the top 10 highest appropriated government agencies. Now, this started off with just being the Oklahoma State Department of Education, because all one has to do is Google mismanagement of public funds in Oklahoma, and you get page after page after page of the Oklahoma State Department of Education misappropriating public tax dollars. Now, one of my Republican colleagues, Chad uh, Codwell, uh, recommended that instead of just focusing on State Department of Education, he offered an amendment to make it to the top 10 highest appropriated agencies. And uh, while I have no problem with that, we went ahead and adopted it. It made it off the House floor a few weeks ago. And of all people, you know, they say politics makes strange bedfellows, right? Of right. all people, my Senate author on this is Nathan Dom. And wow. he, he actually got it through a Senate committee, uh, voted unanimously. But all this bill does is it requires that the State Department of Education and the other nine highest appropriated agencies have to submit quarterly expenditure reports to the legislature on a quarterly basis instead of an annual basis. This is going to help us have more eyes on the budget, on what they're spending money on. Particularly, this was because of the state superintendent's spending spree with taxpayer dollars, jet setting across the country, uh, promoting himself on his own promotion tour. Um, but in addition, we have the other nine agencies, which is going to be great as well. We just need to have more oversight, more eyes on this budget, on how agencies are spending their money, which ultimately goes back to the accountability of taxpayer dollars. Well, absolutely. When it's done on an annual basis, you're just kind of looking back at historical. If it's done quarterly, you can catch something before it gets too out of hand, right? Yeah, and things have definitely gotten out of hand. And that's one of the issues we're trying to rein in. So while we're talking about uh, the State Department of Education, there's all, all kinds of things in the news about this. Um, um, the attorney general is arguing against the St. Isidore School, which is um, public tax do dollars being spent in a private religious school, right? Yeah, that happened on Monday. A.G. Drummond went before that state's highest court, the Supreme Court, to argue why it is unconstitutional to allow a a religious charter, public charter school operated and owned by a religious affiliation who said that they would proselytize to children just like any other Catholic school. They went before the Supreme Court to make their arguments on for and against it. Now, just right off the bat, I, I have to say that if the wealthiest religious institution in the history of the world wanted to start their own, uh, their own private school, and, and recruit children and students across the state to attend 100% for that. That is perfectly legal and within their purview. The issue comes when they start wanting a government handout to support their private religious school. Uh, that was the argument that uh, Attorney General Drummond made, and I thought he did a very, a very great job, a job well done in uh, defending the state's constitution and there were several questions that said, well, how does this, uh, how would this be interpreted at the, on the federal level? And while it's pretty obvious that there is the establishment clause at this federal level, A.G. Drummond very wisely said, we are interpreting the Oklahoma state constitution, not the federal constitution. And it was pretty, an interesting moment came when the Supreme Court justices asked A.G. Drummond flat out, is this a test case? And he said unequivocally, yes, it is, meaning the whole purpose of this is to knowingly go up to the Supreme Court to reverse um, centuries of precedent. Now, when they asked that same question to the lawyers from St. Isidora, 
they tried to play it off as, oh, no, this is just a simple interpretation of the state constitution. When everyone knows that this is absolutely a test case, not only are people from Oklahoma invested in this separation, this dissolvement of the separation of church and state, but people all over the country and maybe the world were had their eyes on the Oklahoma uh, Supreme Court on Monday to see how they would rule. Now, we haven't received that ruling yet. The Oklahoma State Supreme Court is not on a timeline or they don't have a deadline to make a decision, but we would expect that to be coming out pretty soon, especially considering that the governor and the state superintendent and St. Isidora has been marketing this class, this uh, religious virtual charter school to parents uh, across the state where they've already had 200 kids sign up and um, that would begin in in July and then I believe start in August in the actual school year so uh, I believe that the state supreme court will make a decision before then and then either way whether they um, agree or not it, it will be appealed uh, it, AG Drummond said if they rule in favor of St. Isidora uh, he will appeal to the higher courts and vice versa. So it is definitely something to keep your eye on. And if anyone would like to watch those oral arguments, they're only 30 minutes each for each side. But that uh, link is available on YouTube and you can find it by just going a couple posts down on my uh, social media pages, either on X, Facebook or Instagram. So if both sides have vowed that they're going to appeal whatever the decision is. Whatever the decision is, somebody's going to appeal. My question is, why are they taking enrollment? Because they're taking enrollment. So what are these parents to do um, with their students? You know, depend. why are they doing it? You know, um, I don't expect you to know why they're doing it. I just, I want to put the question, you have an idea? Yeah, well, unfortunately, State Superintendent Walters and Governor Stitt are using parents as political fodder. They believe that if they can get investment or buy in right now from parents that could help their case. It's only setting uh, Oklahomans up for future disappointment, much like they did with the debacle on the teacher pay raise. Um, this is just using Oklahomans as political pawns to push an agenda that is unconstitutional and creates a whole mess of problems going down the road. Um, and which it already has to this point. But the question is, is it going to continue getting worse? Um, this dissolvement of separation in church and state has become more pronounced over the years as church attendance has started going down. More people are getting their spiritual fulfillment on social media, uh, watching their pastors online. There's a lot of life church type uh, platforms where people don't have to go to church. And as a result, um, their attendance is falling, tithing is falling. And so now they're trying to dip into government coffers to be sustainable. Uh, but while they're doing that, they're trying to influence their particular religious morality on to all of society, which is a theocratic um, notion. We are not a theocrat. We, we are not a theocracy. We're a democracy. And um, while maybe their church attendance is, is falling and they're not getting as much ties. Uh, maybe they should um, look at new approaches to getting their message out. But I find it really difficult um, to, for particularly the Catholic religion, uh, to make this case when we know that, as I said, the wealthiest in religious institution in the history of the world that just, you know, down the street from my house built a tens of millions of dollars um, sanctuary on behalf of a martyr, which it's a beautiful place, but uh, they have the means to do this uh, without needing our taxpayer dollars to do it. Uh, what it comes down to is churches don't pay taxes, so why should they be allowed to use ours to fund their personal agendas? You know, when I was a young person, I had a bunch of, we're going to call them jalopies. I loved my cars, but they had a lot of problems. And because of that, as a woman, I know more about a broken down car than a lot of folks. I can kind of diagnose when a car breaks down. And I think I learned that because it was broken. I feel like the same thing is happening with the Department of Education. We're learning so much about the inner workings of the Department of Education because it's broken and the person in charge of it seems set on breaking it even, even further. But our legislature is trying to fix it. 
I think, right? Um, so there's a recommendation that we add four state board members to the um, to the uh, state board of education. Yeah, that's right. There's a House bill that passed off the House. It's now over in the Senate. I think it just passed out of the Senate committee. But this is really important because the whole reason why we have this uh, Satan is Adora case uh, in front of the state Supreme Court is because the State Board of Education approved for it to go forward. I think there's only four or five, five members on the current State Board of Education um, board that were appointed by the governor. This would add four more members to the State Board of Education with a requirement that they have experience in public education uh, I believe even as superintendents, and instead of being a direct appointment from the governor, this would come as a as a appointment from the Speaker of the House and the Senate pro tem. So you're actually getting people who have experience in public education on a board that's making decisions on behalf of public education. What a novel idea, right? You would think that that would have been assumed, but currently on the State Board of Education, not a single one of the members have experience in a public education background or pedagogy or uh, have been traditionally trained or have gone to school uh, to be leaders in education, yet they're making these monumental decisions on behalf of public schools across the state. And we've seen this uh, department, um, the State Departments of Education's ineptitude at leading the charge of helping our schools and helping our teachers. They can't even fulfill vacancies right now, all the top leadership positions from grant writers to lawyers have left. They are basically hanging on by the string. Meanwhile, State Superintendent Walters at the latest school board meeting came out and said he's going to create a brand new office for charter schools, private schools, and parent tax credits for private schools. When the media asked him, can you give us more details on this? The only thing he could defer to was this is going to be the first of its kind in the entire nation. Can't give any more details outside of that. One reporter said, well, how are you gonna staff this if you can't even staff your current agency, the Department of Education? Uh, and then of course, deflection and going back to bragging about how it will be the first of its kind in the nation. All of that being a distraction to the epic failures that um, have persisted over the past six, seven months. So, yeah. Exactly. And so I just I have to remind our, our viewing audience that he's the superintendent of public instruction. That's his job. That's his job title. And it's just puzzling why he thought it was important to open the office of private schools. Like he's calling it something else, but it's really the office of private schools under the banner of the State Department of Education. It's just but it also tells you where his focus is. Right. We have all of these emergency certified teachers. We have all these folks who he's threatening uh, certification. You know, focus, sir. I just just need you to focus on public instruction. That's right. And going back to our earlier conversation for people who may just have tuned in when we were talking about private schools. I mean, all the more power to private institutions creating their own schools uh, if a parent would choose for them to go to that school. That's great. It's just as a state, we are constitutionally obligated to provide a free and public education for all. And the moment that all these different IRS recognized religions start dipping into uh, taxpayer dollars, it's going, to deplete, it's going to deplete the public education that so many of 90% uh, of kids in Oklahoma depend on. And so if, if you go to a private school and you, and you pay your way 100% more power to you, just don't rely on our tax dollars to um, fund your way or to have a, a handout, especially with a um, institution that has the means to easily create a virtual charter school on their own. Uh, I think it gets lost sometimes that this isn't a brick and mortar this is a online charter school when just a few years ago, state leaders like Stitt and Walters were trying to discourage virtual learning, get kids back in school. This is all the school is, is 100% virtual. So it's got a layer, an added layer of hypocrisy on top of it all. Well, that, that makes it fun. And I appreciate our state legislature for, again, seeing, seeing a, an opportunity and um, proposing a solution to actually deal with the issue rather than smoke and mirrors. I appreciate that. And 
I just want to say that as we're in the middle of filing, we are on day two of our three day filing um, in this um, legislative session, right? We're at the time when new candidates are filing and um, I'm excited to keep clicking over and seeing how many new people have, have, um, have filed, how many folks that I've recruited from all over the state, how many folks that came out of nowhere that we're grateful for. Um, you're at the Capitol, what's the energy like? You know, it's been kind of interesting. There are lower or fewer filings this year than any years in the past, but I'm really excited for the Democratic candidates who have courageously put their name on the ballot, some in extremely red districts, knowing that they're going to go out there and they're going to talk to people on the door face to face, they're going to change some minds, they're going to make a difference, but ultimately very unlikely that they win. That Those people who do that are my heroes. They are out there to make a difference. And we've got people who are, who are running, uh, who are teachers, who are in the healthcare industry, who've just had enough. I, we had a, a candidate luncheon a couple of days ago, I think it was yesterday actually, and we heard from candidates and they got to explain why they're running. And it's for deeply personal reasons that many people felt an obligation to do something and not just sit idly back. And if that means going out and busting their tail every single day, fully knowing that they have very little chance of winning, but knowing that they're going to make a difference by getting out there and sharing different perspectives in communities that may have not heard of anything different, means the world and ultimately that's going to make a big difference in the long run for the state of oklahoma and future generations so thank you to everyone who has put their name on the ballot we've also have had some surprises um, of people not choosing to run and file again representative maury turner has decided not to run again and there's going to be a really healthy and competitive primary in that seat and then also the um, chair of the common education committee uh, Rhonda Baker has chosen not to run again, and I do have a lot of respect for Madam Chair Baker. Um, she has uh, sometimes um, gone against the, her own party for to stand up for her principles, and um, she is well respected amongst the entire legislature, and it's going to be a big vacuum to fill in the Common Education Committee. Uh, we came in together in 2016, and so if anyone, if anyone who's watching this, I doubt Chair, Madam Chair Baker is watching this, but uh, I, just to reiterate how uh, great she's been to work with and she will be missed in the um, Common Education Committee as well. So I want to add something to something you said. You said we had folks filing in, in deep red seats and knowing that um, it's, it's going to be a tough race. And here, here's what I want to say. We had mun municipal elections, right, uh, on Tuesday. And Democrats won in places like Yale, Oklahoma, and Colgate, and Newkirk. Um, and so what I will say is, even though we have folks running in places where we don't currently have Democrats serving, it is not impossible. We are making gains. And um, the more Democrats we put on the ballot, the more chance we have of electing Democrats. And so I am grateful for all of the folks who are running in Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Norman, the places where it is um, more likely to get elected. But I'm also grateful for the folks who are running from um, towns outside of Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Norman, um, because we have to expand our map. We have to take our message um, to the entire state because I say this all the time. I believe we're on the right side of this of this discussion. We're on the we're on the right side, and we just got to get our message out there. And the best way to get our message out there is to get a candidate. I'm really happy you made that point. It's a much more optimistic take, and you're exactly right. In the latest elections, we've seen that the extremist far right candidates have lost out to Democrats who get out there with a solid message and talk to voters. And once they have someone to um, compared to on, on you know, a, a Moms for Liberty candidate, for example, of which none of them won their elections. Um, it, we can give people an a, a easy choice of um, extremism or common sense. Common sense. And, and people choose the, the latter, common sense. And so um, if anyone's watching who's running in a deep red seat, don't take that what I said is, a, is pessimism, but as um, the fact that you will need to work hard 
and that it will take a lot of effort on the doors and calling friends and family in the beginning, asking for donations, not for yourself, but for your message, for the, in, for the vision of Oklahoma that you have going forward. They're funding a message to help you get it out to more people. And I know that fundraising is one of the more difficult parts of running a campaign. It's always fun to get out there once you get in the groove on the doors, talking to people. It can be pretty exciting and fun. And it can be addicting and and but then also you need to be able to pay for those flyers and those yard signs and those digital ads uh and everything that goes with um a campaign so keep that in mind while not uh impossible it is hard but it, it is possible with the right work ethic and um and support and that's one great thing that uh, alicia you and the Oklahoma democratic party have done in conjunction with the Oklahoma House Dems and Oklahoma Senate Dems is working together to collaborate to create an environment that is more conducive and supportive of our candidates. And so that has come a long way in the past eight years since I ran in 2016. And I want to say thank you for doing that. And I hope to continue seeing it build and grow in momentum, which I know it will. I'm very excited about that. And that's a perfect segue, a perfect way for us to end this in that some of our candidates won't make it across the finish line. They won't. But what they will do is carry our message. And what they will do is move the needle, right? Some races, it will take two or three races before that's winnable by a Democrat. And they will move the needle. And we are we are grateful for that. And so for those who are, of us who are grateful for that, I just want to say, find a Democrat or two to support right now. Don't wait until the primary. Don't wait until later. Don't wait until closer to November. They need your help right now more than any other time because this is a time when they're establishing and setting up their campaigns. Now is the time. If you if you can, if you are able to donate to a candidate, now's the time to do it. Donate to a candidate. If you're not able to write a check, but you're able to donate time to drive them around while they knock doors, they need that and they'll take that. If you're able to connect them to folks who can write checks or folks who can do graphic design, please do that. Our candidates need all of that kind of help. Um, and that's, that is how we change what is happening in Oklahoma. That's right. Use your time, talent, and treasure and uh, we'll, we'll be all right. So thank you all for having me. I will keep you posted next week. I always look forward to joining you, Alicia. Thank you again for having me. All right. Thank you. You guys, and I'll be back here tomorrow at 415. Have a good evening.